Radio, Fox Sports Radio, FS1. So, J-Mac, in my life, I do not remember a time where I watched the Jets and I was a glass-half-full guy. I see talent there. I see back-to-back great drafts there. You, you got to feel good about it. You forget the Mark Sanchez teams? I mean, I know I like Ethan? them, Revis? but I I never was a huge Rex Ryan guy. Understandable. <laughs> a lot of bluster from them. But um, they had great great foundational defensive pieces. Offensive line was No, no, they they were they were um but it's um you know, they're they're you know, I'll, I'll give an example. The Raiders are 1 and 4. I actually think they have a chance to turn it around. Yeah. Um I mean, you don't just because you're. I mean, Seattle right now is not a great roster, playing out of their mind. Mm-hmm. So you can be last place and hopeful. You know, the Jets. I don't think have a roster that equals Buffalo or Miami now, but I do think Salah's defense is starting to show signs of you know the intensity and energy he brings to the table. The arrows pointing up for the I Jets. Think so. right? There's a buy sign there. So let's just let's not waste any time here. Uh, let's do my blazing five. Here we go. <laughs> Let's blaze it up. Fire it up. It's Collins blazing five. Ravens at Giants. Like it? I love it. The Ravens are one of two teams, Philly's the other one, that have led by at least 10 points in every game. Their offense has been spectacular. Lamar's running. He's passing. It's amazing. They don't spend much money on receivers, but they're top five in virtually everything. Points, yards, big plays. The Giants are coming off a 14-point comeback win against the Packers. I think they're bound to come down a little. And Daniel Jones is 29th in the league in yards per game and 27th in yards per attempt. It was a nice win against Green Bay, but I don't think Green Bay is very good. And I think Baltimore is exceptional. I think the Giants pull back. I love Baltimore in this spot, minus six. Ravens win 28 to 20. Jets at Packers. Jets are off back-to-back wins, 2-0 on the road. I like them here, plus seven. Robert Sala's defense is playing hard and with passion, but it's the rookies, these last two drafts, last year's draft, the rookies for the Jets are all contributing. Brees Hall, Sauce Gardner, Garrett Wilson. They've got four different receivers, only team in the league with 200-plus receiving yards. There's guys open on every pass for the Jets. Guys are wide open. What happened to the Packers' defense, by the way? What happened to it? I loved it coming into the season. They've disappointed everywhere. I think the Jets go in, they're real, they've got firepower, and they upset Green Bay. This number may go to seven and a half. You could bet it up. I'm going to take the Jets with the upset, 28-27. 49ers at Falcons. I actually think this is going to be a nail-biter. Falcons plus five and a half is my play. Arthur Smith is a very clever coach. They're top 10 scoring offense in the league. Do you know they have 37 big plays offensively? And you don't think they have any talent. They're a top three rushing offense. And the Niners are falling apart. Bosa out. Kinlaw out. Armstead out. Emmanuel Mosley out. Jimmy Ward out. Forget Elijah Mitchell and Trent Williams. San Francisco is running out of healthy bodies. I think the Falcons can run it on them. I think the game is quick. It's a lot of handoffs. They take away Jimmy Garoppolo, who watches a lot of it. Niners win close. Close. Even the kicker's out for the Niners, by the way. They win close, but I like Atlanta the side here. 24-23 San Francisco. Buccaneers at Steelers. I got one rule. If you get humiliated in the NFL, I almost always take you the following week. I'm taking the Steelers plus eight and a half. It's a bounce back spot. Hey, by the way, you can all bang on Kenny Pickett. Last week against Buffalo, he had 34 completions in the win, 327 yards, and three plays over 20 yards. I like Pickett. He just got overwhelmed. And the Bucks' offense is second-worst running offense in the league, so even if Tampa takes the lead, they can't run it and eat the clock. Atlanta had a chance to beat him in the end, and Atlanta was dominated by Tampa. Even if Tampa leads, San Francisco will get possessions. I like the Steelers a lot here, plus eight and a half. They don't win 27-21, but I think it's a very competitive football game. Cardinals at Seahawks. I don't even understand this line. Seahawks plus two and a half, I'll take it all day. They're scoring a bunch of points. Seahawks are converting on 48% of third downs. That's top three in the league. Offensively, what do you want me to say? Points, yards, big plays, all of it. Meanwhile, the Cardinals are the worst first half team in the league. What does it mean? Division rival playing behind. Now, Arizona may come back to cover and win. 
But I know this. Seattle will lead. Seattle, Geno Smith with a lead. Running the football, an improved offensive line. I haven't bet the Seahawks in a while. I like them in this spot. I think right now they're playing great football early in games. They jump out to a lead. The question is, can they hold on? Because Arizona's been a very good fourth quarter team. I'm going to take the Seahawks 28-23 in the Northwest. So there you go. I like dogs. Outside of Baltimore, I like underdogs this week. Pittsburgh two weeks in a row, Colin, huh? This is a proud league. Everybody bangs on. You know, we always bury all these young quarterbacks, but Kenny Pickett in a la- against a great defense in a windy environment threw for 330 yards. It's not terrible. Um, you know, the other thing, everybody was banging on the game last night on the internet, and it was like I was fascinated by it, and the reason I was fascinated by it is because I, I think I think Matt Eberflus is a good coach. Uh, I think Getsy, the offensive coordinator, was doing everything he could to get the pocket moving. I don't know if Justin Fields is ever going to be great from the pocket, but he's talented. I thought it was a very interesting three-hour watch on the Chicago Bears. There's a lot of things to be hopeful for. Unfortunately, history tells us they don't do offense well. Who's their best receiver of all time? You have to go back to the 60s. One of their best offensive players ever is Mike Ditka. So they just don't do offense well. That's why I don't know if Justin Fields is talented enough to overcome what I believe is the worst receiving core in the league in the bottom 5 O line. Josh Allen didn't have a good O-line, but Josh Allen is a transformational talent. He's overcome his first three years, a bad O-line and no running game. Defensive coach, windy weather. I don't, he's rare. He's Andrew Luck. There are these guys that are just, they can overcome a bunch of obstacles. There's a bunch of offensive obstacles for the Bears. I don't know if Justin Fields can overcome them. That that O-line and that receiving core, I'm not trying to be, you know, snarky here, but it's it's bad. Like that that receiving core, I made a comment about it last night on the internet, and Roddy White, former great receiver, is like, you're not wrong. Like that receiving core does they have one number two receiver, Darnell Moody. That's it. The rest of those guys, San Francisco, Pettis. They thought he was a bust. It's a lot of cast-off guys. So I don't know if Justin Fields, what he can do with that. And Peter King now joins us live, NBCSports.com. I, I fit, you know, I've said this with Justin Fields. I'm going to be patient because I think sometimes, Peter, the Andrew Lux and the Josh Allens, those are like once a decade that you don't have to be a perfect and they can just win a bunch of games. I watched Chicago last night. I think they're, I really do think they're a well-coached team without any offensive talent in an offensive league. Does that make any sense? Well, I thought Kirk Herbstreit put it well last night. Early in the game, twice, he pointed out the receivers that Justin Fields missed. And he missed them because it appeared, there's an old cliche, Colin, that open in college football is wide open in pro football. Yeah, And, you know, the windows are just smaller and narrower in the NFL than they than in college football. And I think, look, you know that Aaron Rodgers loved Luke Getze. Yes. uh, When he was his almost like his personal coach teacher in uh, Green Bay. And Luke Getze did a great job with Rodgers. So now he's there as the offensive coordinator. And to me. Justin Fields is not very accurate right. right now. Right. And he misses some of the receivers that he should be hitting. This throw last night drove me crazy. The one you just ran yeah. of the perfectly open right. tight end right in the end zone. Right and here. I just said to myself, just watch this. Perfect play action. Watch this. And he's got him wide open and he throws it two feet over his head. I don't know. He's a work in progress, but he's got to learn to take shots to players who aren't wide open, but are going to be about as open as you get in the National Football League. So it's the Bucks and Chiefs this weekend. Uh, uh, excuse me, the Bills and the Chiefs. Um, in the last week, the Chris Jones play, the Jarrett play, um, there is a sense Mike Pereira was on my show earlier this week, and I said, Mike, do you think – The NFL has met with the officials and told them, call it more closely. And Mike Pereira said no. 
But referees read the paper. Referees see the Tua situation. Referees are on YouTube. And there's this natural inclination to protect the quarterbacks. You don't have to have an email or a meeting. But I do think, Peter, and maybe their heart's in the right place, I do think they've that there's an overreach here. That's what it looks like to me with the defense. I thought Chris Jones made the defensive play of the year for alignment and they wouldn't give it to him. What do you make of what you're seeing? Well, last Sunday after the Teddy Bridgewater play, he goes out on the first play of the game. Nobody sees him wobble. Nobody sees him unsteady. Right. Other than apparently the, uh, the spotter upstairs who can, he has the, he has the power to get people out of the game. And then after afterwards, Teddy Bridgewater goes in. He does not show any signs of a concussion. He's cleared from that, but he can't come back in the game. So that happened. And then the Grady Jarrett play with Tom Brady happened. And I, 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 and I wrote in my column on Monday, am I the only one to be thinking that these two are connected just in the mind of, you know, the officials and the people you know, whose job it is to keep players safe. And I'll just say this, Colin, on Sunday night, I made a call around to people who I know very well in the league and one long time, very top executive in the league say, you know, you guys in the media, you always have overreaction Sunday. Well, you know what we had or overreaction Monday. What we had today is overreaction Sunday. Everybody is being too careful because of Tua. Mm -hmm. And I think that is exactly what has happened. The league has uh, spent the whole week saying, no, that isn't the case. We're calling the way we always have. Look, that Grady Jarrett call was pathetic. Absolutely pathetic. We all know it. And, and the Chris Jones call was understandable because he landed on him with his body weight. However, he also dislodged the ball right. and got the ball. And there was no other way he could land, by the way. But but at least that was understandable because he did land on him with his body weight. But be that as it may, I do think that the NFL is erring on the side of overcaution yeah. right now. So, you know, it, it, it's interesting here. Um, I, I, I watch Russell Wilson in the previous four years. He was very good. His passer rating is like 105, 106. But something hit me last week and it was really stark. He has lost all ability to accurately land deep balls, and it was his specialty in Seattle, the raindrop. He now is incapable of it. He's he's underthrows him. He overthrows him. Now, there's a story this week. He had a shot. But when you talk to your sources, they're probably laughing in Seattle. But is there a feeling that this is just Pete saw it before we did, and he's washed? Because if he can't deliver the deep ball, Peter, that was his, that was his number two pitch. After mobility, that was his great curveball. That was his out pitch. Is there a feeling he's washed in the league? I mean, there's a lot of people with varying opinions right now on Russell Wilson. Colin, I'm sorry. I refuse to believe that a guy who the last five years, every year he's in the top seven in the NFL in passer rating, and he's 22nd now, I refuse to believe he fell off the end of the cliff. Okay? I think there's two things at play here. Number one, he has to regain the use of his legs. That's part of his, his, his weaponry. And I don't know what's going on. I don't know whether he told uh, Nathaniel Hackett, I don't want to run anymore, or I, you know, I'm not, I, I, I want to play from the pocket. Yeah. Or whether there's something else at play. And I don't know what that would be, but he needs to start running again. Colin, do you realize in five games, he's only run in, and I'm not counting kneel downs, he's only run 14 times. Well, you know, he averaged in his, in his height of his success in, in Seattle, six rushes a game. And he's got to get back to that. That's part of his game. Number two, I understand what you're saying about the deep ball, and I get it. We don't have enough evidence yet that he can't throw it or that he's lost his mojo. It, it looks bad. It absolutely looks bad. I refuse to believe that someone who isn't uh, physically incapable of doing it, and I don't see any way that he's physically incapable of doing it, just lost it overnight. I don't think he did. I still think he's going to be a good quarterback. 
But you're right. It does look bad now, and I get it. He's got to get his legs back in the game so he has a few more openings in the secondary with safeties and linebackers who are aware that he might run. So um, I don't buy the Dak Cooper rush controversy, but I do think it's interesting in New England. Generally, is there a precedent is what I ask myself. So Belichick, remember, Bledsoe is more talented than Mac Jones, was in the middle of a huge contract, and had led the Patriots to a Super Bowl pre-Belichick. And Bill moved off him. And he drafted Garoppolo and wanted, until Robert Kraft stepped in, he drafted Garoppolo and wanted to play him. There's a precedent here. And I think Garoppolo and Bledsoe are more talented than Mac Jones. And I watched Bailey Zappi, and I'm like, I watched Mac Jones early in this year not play well. And I'm watching Bailey Zappi play extraordinarily well. I don't think it's, I have credible people like Ian Rappaport, people, Albert Breer, like, you know, you know what? That backup quarterback controversy, Peter, in New England, I kind of buy it. If the kid wins again this weekend, it's impressive. I kind of buy it. Do you? It, I agree, Colin. It won't shock me. But let's remember one thing when we're comparing, when we look back at the Bledsoe thing, there was something else at play with Bledsoe and Bill Belichick that Bill just simply didn't like. At that time, Drew Bledsoe was doing a lot of stuff on his own, was making a lot of calls that they had not planned to make during the week. When they did the game plan, Bledsoe would do a lot of stuff on his own during the game. Belichick hated that, hated it. And after a while, he said, I want the quarterback to play as we have forecast this game to be played, not making it up as we go along. That might be harsh with Bledsoe because he's a really bright guy. There were reasons why he was doing what he was doing. But I will just say this. Bledsoe, the difference is, you're absolutely right, he was the highest paid player in football. And that was a pretty gutsy call by Belichick to go with Brady, even when both of them were healthy at the end of the 2001 season. Now about this case, look, I just don't think Mac Jones has enough uh, has enough currency in the bank to be sure of anything once he gets hurt. And if Bailey Zappi plays well, is a little bit more accurate, is doing the stuff in the offense that the that the that the, the coaches asked for, I would not be surprised at all if Bailey Zappi continues to play. Yeah, uh, Peter King. There we go. Patrick Mahomes and uh, 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 Josh Allen. You know, I, I said this.